Okay, why don't we get started? I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies, Albert Park, and uh, I'm going to present some of my own work um, on uh, the manufacturing sector in China and uh, the future of jobs. And this um, presentation draws upon several different projects I've been working on related to employment issues in China. And some of them, they're, they're at various stages of progress. And I'm drawing upon bits and pieces to try to tell a more coherent story about what I think is happening in China. And I think there uh, turns out to be some surprising facts about what is happening in the labor market that raise a, a number of, I think, very interesting issues uh, in terms of um, the implications for what China needs to do going forward to uh, help support the economy to create good jobs in an increasingly skilled labor force. So uh, China, of course, has been witnessing steady structural change. Uh, this is a plot of the relative employment shares of the primary sector, mainly agriculture, the secondary sector, which is almost all industry or manufacturing, and the tertiary sector, which is services. And you can see that manufacturing uh, has been important um, especially in the 2000s, there was a very substantial increase from 20-some percent to 30 percent, which is very fast, uh, a structural change. Uh, but then in the last few years, you can see it's basically plateaued out and starting to decline. Um, and the sector that is really taking off is services. Um, and uh, that's a good thing in, in many respects for creating skilled jobs in that the service sector tends to employ much more, a much higher share of skilled workers than the manufacturing sector. So the manufacturing sector has been challenged by very rapidly increases in wages. And this is from, this is official data on uh, average manufacturing wages, wages over time. And you can see that the real manufacturing wage doubled from 2007 to 2014. So that's really increasing the cost pressure, especially for labor-intensive manufacturing firms in China. A couple other features of the labor market is that the returns to uh, schooling and especially higher education, college education, have increased dramatically during the reform period. But again, uh, there's evidence that since the mid-2000s or so, it started to plateau. And there are some data sets which even suggest the returns to higher education has even declined a little bit. Um, and the returns of schooling went from a very low rate, which is very abnormal, to a rate of about 10% per year, which is very normal in many uh, market economies in China and has kind of been steady there. Another interesting feature uh, that suggests it, uh, there has been a reversal kind of of the wage structure or a change in the direction is that starting again in 2007, you see that uh, the wages of migrant workers relative to formal workers has, uh, instead of decreasing, has been increasing. Of course, the wages for everybody has been increasing, but relatively speaking now, we're seeing low-skill wages rising faster than high-skill wages uh, in urban labor markets. One motivation for trying to think about the uh, structure of jobs in the future is to understand its implications for inequality. And we all know that in China, we've also seen a rapid increase in inequality during the reform period. This is a plot um, of uh, the estimates from a number of different studies. And then uh, most recently in the early 2000s, there have been a, several national surveys conducted in China, household surveys. And they're all producing estimates that are similar, a Gini coefficient of about 0.53 on average. Um, and this looks like a trend. But if you look at the official data, which are these purple triangles, the official uh, National Bureau of Statistics estimates of inequality actually show that it's, it's kind of plateaued out and now has been declining for the last four or five years, inequality in China. And I think that's also consistent with falling returns to education increasing wages of unskilled labor. OK. And uh, this is also from uh, Xie and Zhou uh, paper, where they look at what is explaining the variation in income. And the circles are the share explained in a multivariate framework. So 
uh, education explains more than any of these other factors. It explains about something like 10% of the overall variation in income inequality. And uh, so while it's not, ex there's a lot that's unexplained by difference in education, obviously. Um, as in most countries, a lot of the driving force uh, for rising inequality is changes in the returns to education. That's been a dominant factor, for instance, in the US and many OECD countries. So in the US, there's been evidence of job polarization where uh, if you look at the skill percentile measured by the mean of different occupations, so these, these are kind of plotting different occupations, the occupations with low wages have been growing faster and the occupations with high wages have been going, growing faster in terms of the number of jobs created, whereas these middle skill jobs have not been increasing. And a lot of people have attributed that to either uh, computers or technology substituting these routine middle skill jobs or kind of an outsourcing argument where uh, you can embody the routine skills in trade and then you can basically have a lot of routine stuff in, including call centers or back end um, service sector work but also um, you can import goods that are produced using routine methods and therefore your own economy doesn't have to do that. Okay, and this is, uh, there have been some efforts to characterize the nature of the tasks involved in work. And one effort using um, uh, labor department data from the US on what each occupation is asked to do finds that, again, the kind of non-routine analytic and interactive jobs have been increasing over the decades and the manual and the, non, and the routine, both cognitive and manual jobs, have been declining over time. So this is, again, a uh, proposed explanation for this hollowing out, hollowing out of middle skill jobs. And the interesting thing in China is that if you look at this year's World Development Report, or the World Bank, which is on um, the internet, basically, they do an analysis of a similar analysis that I just showed you for the US of the growth in high-skilled, middle-skilled, and low-skilled occupations in different countries during the 2000s, the decade of the 2000s. The starting and ending years differ somewhat for each country. But roughly, you can see that these negative red bars are also uh, suggesting a decline in middle-skilled jobs in most countries in the world, whether it be high-income countries or low- and middle-income countries. But there's a few exceptions, and the most not notable exception is China. Right, where China has this red bar that's uh, positive and relatively large in size, which is saying that in China, middle skill jobs are actually increasing, unlike the rest of the world. So that is, uh, raises an obvious question. Why is that happening in China? What does it mean for jobs in China? If you look at another um, piece of evidence where we do a similar thing to that US figure, you plot the mean wages by occupation percentile, the, the, the occupation mean wages by the wage percentiles in 2005, you can see that the growth in jobs is concentrated more in the lower middle skill jobs, right? With not as much at the bottom and a little bit less in the high skill jobs, okay? Now that's kind of puzzling because we know that the Chinese workforce is becoming more and more educated, right? And uh, so that would suggest that, you know, we should see more employment in higher skilled jobs, right? But that's, that's not happening. That's not where the jobs are increasing. And so that kind of also raises issues about interpretation, why that might be the case. Um, if we think about what is going to determine the future of good job creation in China, and by good job I just mean we'd like to create high-paying jobs that reward skilled workers for their skill in an increasingly skilled, uh, with an increasingly skilled labor market. Of course, the supply of skills is really going to be important. The education, we know China had a higher education expansion, which is why the labor force is becoming much more educated. It's much easier to get into college now, and many more people are going to college. There's, a, of course, a lot of training issues, whether the government is going to tr provide training, whether firms are going to make investments in workers that's going to affect the skill level of the workforce. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff on the demand side for skills and tasks which are going to determine uh, whether there are uh, 
there's a demand to hire people in different jobs. And that's going to relate to the demand coming from changes in domestic consumption as incomes rise. Uh, and we know from international experience that as incomes rise, the demand for many types of services increases uh, quite strongly, and the demand for higher quality goods uh, should increase um, as well. Um, but for uh, firms to be able to meet these demands and produce to meet this, these higher skill requirements it requires that they, uh, they upgrade, right? They increase their capacity to produce these things and still what is a globally competitive economy um, and meet that demand and create jobs. We also know that the world has become much more globalized, so international trade can have a very large effect on the nature of goods and services produced in the economy, um, especially when global production chains make it possible for China, as it has done uh, for much of the reform period, specialize in very uh, labor-intensive assembly-type kinds of operations in these global uh, production chains. And of course, there's technology, uh, which um, there's, of course, an international dimension to technology, computers, cheaper to do many things, robots, other, other things that you could buy. You don't even have to produce yourself. But of, of course, it can also relate to own innovation to create new technologies that will allow you to produce uh, goods or services in a better way or in a different way than you did before and that are maybe more appropriate to changes in factor prices. Okay, I'm just laying these out as a set of things to keep in the back of my mind as we look to the, to the results that we're going to see later. Okay, so I want to do two things in this presentation to answer, try to answer two questions. One is just to get a sense about how industrial firms are responding to these rising labor costs, uh, especially for unskilled labor. Are the responses kind of negative? Are firms shutting down and downsizing their production and, and uh, employment? Are they more neutral? Neutral? Are they relocating to interior parts of China where there's lower wages or perhaps even to other countries, which you could, might think is negative in the sense that they're no longer going to be employing Chinese workers, um, but for the firm is maybe not negative. And then there could be some uh, responses that we think are more positive, that they, they upgrade, that they adapt to the higher uh, uh, wage costs and they produce new products, they move up the value chain, they invest in capital or more skill-intensive production technologies, et cetera. And then um, after I look at that, I'm going to try to come back and think about how is structural change affecting the demand for these abstract routine and manual tasks to, get, to come back to that question of why perhaps middle-skilled jobs have been increasing in China over the decade of the 2000s. And so I'm going to look at some evidence on the demand for tasks and how they're changing over time in different sectors of the economy broadly, and then come back to some micro-level data on manufacturing and try to understand how firm characteristics are influencing the demand for different tasks. And this analysis in this second part using um, uh, information on the task content of what people are doing in China is, uh, is new. It's really the first time uh, I think that data has made it possible to do this and it's because we included a bunch of questions in a survey that we conducted in the Pearl River Delta last, last year and this year. Okay, so um, in both sections I'm going to draw on this data from the China Employer Employee Survey. The first wave was done in August, September 2015, and that's the data I'm analyzing in this presentation. Um, it includes uh, data on 570 manufacturing firms in 20 districts in 13 cities in Guangdong with an 80% response rate, uh, working very closely with the uh, quality inspection um, government offices to get access to firms, um, uh, led by a group at Wuhan University. Um, and then in each firm, we surveyed a random sample of six to 10 workers, uh, including at least uh, two or three managers. Um, and so we have this linked sample of workers and the firms, which we can connect. Um, and uh, it's a collaboration among a bunch of several institutes. We did a second round this past summer in Guangdong and we added another province, Hubei, and uh, we hope uh, the year after next to expand to really have national coverage in eight or nine provinces. 
Okay, so uh, the questionnaires, both the firm and workers have a number of modules that look at different aspects of uh, the firm's um, activities and the workers' background and job characteristics. Uh, if this is just very quickly some description of the sample. It's a pretty good spread across different sizes of the firm in terms of employment. Uh, the sampling rule was, I think, that firms had to be have at least uh, 20 workers to be sampled. So we get quite small firms. Um, and then uh, it's open to all different sectors. And so we have the most in electronics, uh, some fair amount in textiles, but then some in some more skill intensive sectors like chemicals, metals, non-metal machinery and equipment. Um, there's quite a large, a large share of foreign invested firms in Guangdong. Um, with the bulk being private and very few state firms, which is not surprising in, uh, in the Pearl River Delta. The overall performance of the firms in the data set, and this is looking at 2014 and retrospectively to 2013, uh, just looking at uh, the, the profitability and the changes in revenue, you can see that Overall, profits are increasing on average over this period, um, but there's uh, half the firm, 55% are showing an increase in profits, 41% are showing a decrease in profits, and 18% have a negative profit in 2013, and 14% have a negative profit in 2014. So there's quite a bit of heterogeneity. Some firms are doing fine quite a number of firms are not doing as well as they were doing before, and some are losing money. And these are of the firms that we were able to survey. If, we, if you ask the firms what is the main challenges to their development, by far the number one answer is labor costs, followed by uh, market demand, taxation, and then issues related to technology or worker skills. Uh, finance was not a main constraint reported by the firms. Uh, from the firm question where we can look at the average structure of employment in the manufacturing firms, you can see that about two-thirds of the workers in these firms are frontline production workers. Um, the top or mid-level managers account for about 7.4% of the workers. Then the other managers and, and office workers actually are 10.3%. Then we have technicians about 7.5% uh, and 4% are salesmen. And then there are these other people who are like cooks and security guards and, and whatnot. You can see that the wage uh, increases are, if you measure it by yearly income uh, changes in 2013 to 2014 or monthly wage changes from 2013 to 14 and 2014 to the middle of 2015 when we did the survey, they're all going up. This is actually for the same people. So this is really controlling for the workers, right? Um, it's a within worker change. You can see that uh, the wages being paid to workers and others, which are also very low-skilled jobs, are, are increasing faster on average than for the high-skilled workers. The salesmen are a bit of an exception. They're, main, they're often paid on commission. And uh, you can see uh, that the education level of these different types of workers vary dramatically. So among top and middle managers, about 40% are college graduates and above. Uh, as well as for the kind of other managers and office workers, technical workers, similar. Salespeople are the most educated, 60% are college graduates. And then production workers, almost nobody is a college graduate. Uh, other workers also very low. Overall, about in our data, about 20% are college graduates, which are, is higher than for the country as a whole in manufacturing. Um, if you look at the employment changes, one of the take-home findings of the survey was that overall employment actually fell from 2013 to 2014 in these firms that we interviewed. Again, we're not capturing exit and entry of firms, but among the firms that we found and existed over these two years. And this is almost all a reduction in the scale of production workers, which is over 5% of the production workers in these firms were laid off, right? Or it's the net change, so there was a reduction in the size of the production works. So if that suggests there is really some downsizing occurring, um, man managers are not, are increasing, if anything. So this is 
broadly consistent with the idea that skills are being upgraded in the firms. Um, and then across different sectors, you also see differences. The textile sector, which is probably the most labor intensive, had the biggest reduction. Um, electronic devices as well, and then uh, less so in mixed for the more um, capital intensive sectors. One other thing that was very interesting is that if we calculate in the 13 cities that we surveyed in, if you look at the mean wage changes among the workers and the firms that we surveyed in those cities, again, this is a within worker effect, you see that there's quite a lot of variation in the average change in the uh, wages over, over this recent period. And this is consistent with a local labor markets kind of idea, which has also found some support in US, US research which suggests that it's not actually that easy for workers to move very quickly from one city to another, even in, uh, even in the same province, right? So wages may be going down in some places and up in other places based on the different labor market conditions. Most economists in a perfect labor market would expect all wages kind of to move together, right? If the labor market was perfectly integrated. And we're gonna use this variation kind of as a source of exogenous change and differences in the exposure of different firms to wage changes. Okay, now how are firms responding? There's some descriptive evidence um, on how firms are, are uh, behaving as a, whole, as a group. One thing we found was that uh, about 10% of the firms had actually stopped production in a one and a half year period from January 2013, which is when the economic census was done in China. And we, our sampling frame is basically the economic census data. And so when we went and did the survey, um, uh, sorry, this should be January 2014, not 2013. We did the survey in July 2015, and by that time, 10% of the firms that we know did exist in these places no longer were producing. And in terms of relocation, only 3% of sample firms re relocated uh, among the ones, again, sampled based on the um, January 2014 sampling frame. And most of them were moving relatively close to other parts of Guangdong. Only one went to Jiangxi and one went to Vietnam, right? So there's been a lot of this kind of talk that firms are moving, gonna move to uh, Vietnam and other places, but we don't really see it yet, in, at least in our data. And then finally, another possible response is outsourcing. Uh, this is the idea that uh, you can keep your firm here, but you can start outsourcing some of your production to a firm, let's say, in Jiangxi, or you could even open up a branch firm in some other part of China. And that would also maybe be a way around the higher local labor costs, right? But we don't really see much happening. Most of the people, we have a question in the survey saying, where is your, the production activity in your firm occurring? And almost all of it's being done locally, right? With a few kind of outsourcing or having some of their production being done in other places, but pretty, pretty minimal. Okay, so not a lot of evidence of good responses, right? Or even neutral responses. So in the empirical analysis, we're gonna look at the existing firms that are not moving or shutting down uh, but are staying there and producing and seeing among these firms is employment uh, responding to the wage changes, are firms upgrading in response to this more expensive skilled labor, and are, are there any factors that are intermediating this responsiveness of employment uh, to wages? Now, we're somewhat limited by the fact that, you know, we only collected one year of data and we collected a couple of years retrospectively, but um, it's going to be a lot more, we can do a lot more methodologically once we have more years of data. Um, so we run a regression where we are focusing on kind of the city mean wage changes and uh, starting uh, mean wages uh, and separately for unskilled wages and skilled wages and seeing how they're affecting changes in employment, total employment, employment of unskilled workers, employment of skilled workers. Um, and then we're including some other uh, firm variables. I don't want to... Uh, get bogged down too much in the technical aspect. This is kind of consistent with a um, firm optimization problem with constant returns of scale and adjustment costs. So you can derive that specification from a model of firm behavior. And so this is what we find. Uh, we find that total employment is responsive to the change in the city unskilled wage and also the lag 2013 wage. 
So both of them are, are sharply negative, which means places that uh, firms in high wage places and places where wages are increasing faster are, are downsizing more. And uh, it's significant really for the reduction in unskilled workers, not as much for skilled, but the point estimate for skilled is also negative and of similar magnitude. So these firms are just reducing employment overall. And if we look at intermediating factors, uh, we interact this uh, uh, change in the city unskilled wage with uh, different firm characteristics. And we find the only thing that really matters is exporting dummy, and which means that it's, and it's positive, which means that for exporting firms, they don't seem to be responding to local wage, wage changes uh, compared to non-exporting firms. And that could be that they're embedded in global production chains so that you know, they already have a commitment to produce for very specific customers and are going to meet those obligations and just deal with the wage costs. Um, there may be other explanations for that. So uh, one other thing we did is check for the responsiveness of capital to uh, these wage changes, and we don't find any evidence. We don't find any evidence of other measures of innovation like uh, R&D spending or innovation, patenting, other things. So, the overall finding here is that the main response to the increase in unskilled wage seems to just be downsizing rather than any evidence of upgrading. And that means that if upgrading is occurring at the economy level or in the sector as a whole in manufacturing, it must be being realized by new firm entry or expansion growth of the higher technology firms that are, are doing better in this kind of environment where low skilled wages are the ones that are increasing. Uh, fast, and it could be also that um, uh, that we're just not capturing sufficiently the the variation in the different environment of different firms. So we can explore it a little bit further. But this is kind of what we're finding uh, thus far. Any questions or comments at this point? Yeah. So could it also be that you're still in the short run? Of course. Um, and so I think one thing we'd like to do is connect this to. Uh, other data on these firms, if we connect it to this annual survey of manufacturing firms in China, at least the bigger ones, we should be able to connect them. Then we can go both back farther. And obviously, as we get more years, we'll be able to. Um, yeah, because you might think that the first thing you can do is just downsize if you can't cover the cost. But the investments and other responses may take a little bit more time to, to put together. OK. Um, so let me get back to this second question about why have middle skilled jobs increased in China but not elsewhere? And um, part of it could be related to structural change. Okay, so um, in particular, I'm going to show you that manufacturing jobs are much more routine than service sector jobs. So the fact that manufacturing, obviously built on uh, export demand, kind of grew pretty fast during this period may help explain why the middle skilled jobs increased. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, story based on kind of the evidence I'm going to show you in a second is that, that we think might be part of the story is that China may, instead of offshoring, shoring, maybe inshoring jobs, meaning that you know, in the U if the US is outsourcing a lot of production of these routine intensive uh, goods to other countries. China is the one who's supplying it. So they're the ones who are now using routine types of procedures to produce the goods that then get exported uh, to the US, especially if they're part of global value chains and the Chinese production plant is the one that's just in charge of, you know, production and all the higher, higher end stuff, the design and the marketing, everything is done um, in other countries, in, in home offices or other, other parts of the value chain. And just as a marker here, about 7.5% of urban workers in China worked in foreign firms in 2014. So that's, that's, this is all urban workers. In manufacturing, it's going to be higher than that, much higher, but in the whole urban labor force. Um, and there has to be something about the cost of, the relative cost of hiring uh, workers to do these middle skill uh, jobs as opposed to buying computers and replacing them. Remember, there's always this technology option as well in response to uh, cost pressures, not just outsourcing or insourcing, right? OK, so this is the evidence that I, we just uh, did a couple hours ago. Uh, 
what we did is we used the same US ONOT occupation task data, which was based on very detailed kind of expert analysis of what each occupation in the US, uh, what, what kind of tasks are involved in that job. And we mapped those same occupations to the Chinese occupations. So it's using the US as kind of a benchmark, which may be very inaccurate, but um, because we don't have our own task data for these earlier years, it's the only thing we can do really to look at changes over time and has been done in other countries. Um, and at least we, we do see evidence that, uh, and this is from, two, we looked at it in 2000 and 2005, and this is the 2005 data. I'm just showing the difference in these indicators about the task content of jobs in the service sector jobs and manufacturing sector jobs in China in 2005 from the Chinese mini census occupation data. And you can see that, for instance, that routine tasks much greater in manufacturing than in services, non-routine tasks much greater in services than manufacturing, analytical, non-routine, cognitive, analytical tasks um, higher in services than manufacturing, although this difference is not that great. But this interpersonal aspect of uh, non-routine cognitive work is, is much greater in service sector activities, not surprisingly, than manufacturing. Um, and routine manual jobs are much more prominent in manufacturing sector than services. Okay. And one thing we did is actually we, we uh, looked at the changes from 2000 to 2005, and we actually found routine tasks actually increase over this period. They don't decrease just in terms of the occupations that are increasing employment and how, the, how they're classified using the US task data, right, mappings. Not much, there actually isn't very much change over this five-year period, but, if, but most of it is showing a slight increase in routine tasks, a slight decrease in abstract tasks, okay? Again, this is in a period where, you know, education is expanding, et cetera, in China. So it's kind of suggesting that the structure of employment is not really skilling up. Um, in terms of the uh, occupation structure, even though the supply side may be increasing, right, in terms of the supply of skilled workers. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to update this to, to the 2010 and 2015, the 2010 census, 2015 mini census, then we'll, and we could go back to 1992, so then we'll have a much better picture um, of, 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 of how this is changing broadly over time in different, in different sectors, right? Okay, the other thing we can do, um, we don't have the task data, but we do know the education level of workers in different sectors from the economic census um, in 2004 and 2008. And hopefully, pretty soon, we'll get access to the 2013 economic census data. <coughs> and we can do a very simple decomposition to see whether the change in the skill level of employment is due to changes in the structure of employment, meaning the changes in the share of workers that are employed in services as opposed to manufacturing, um, given that they may have a difference in their skill intensity, and how much is due to the fact that within each, within manufacturing or within services, the skill level of workers is increasing. So there's kind of between sector effect and a within sector effect. Uh, and we can kind of label the between sector effect, kind of the effect of structural change, changes in the structure of which sectors are producing more in the economy on the demand for uh, skilled work, right? So that's this reallocation effect. Um, so, and then we can even go in within manufacturing or within services, we can look at all of the subsectors, like the 30 manufacturing sectors and see are jobs increasing in the skill intensive sectors and therefore overall increasing? Or is it the case that within each manufacturing sector we, still, we see an increase in skill over time? And, um, and so that's what we do. And here are the results, kind of interesting. If you look at the college share of employment in construction, mining, manufacturing, and services, you can see the share in services much higher than the others, right? Um, and uh, if you look at the change in the college share of employment from 2004 to 2008, you can see that all of the sectors are showing an increase in the share of workers who are college employed, right? Especially in services. So services are skilling up faster than the other sectors. Um, and then uh, if you look at the employment shares in the economy, the big ones are obviously manufacturing and services in 2004. And their change from 2004 to 2008 is very small. In fact, manufacturing is declining in this data. 
and service is growing, but not very much, a half a percentage point over this four-year period, and maybe too small a window. So if you decompose that using those formulas I presented, then structural change accounts for only 0.18% of the increase in skill, whereas most of the overall increase in skilled work, uh, which is the sum of this, you know, about 6% increase in the percentage of workers who are college educated in, in the Chinese non-agricultural economy, and but 5.73% of that is explained by within sector changes, right? Within sector changes. Now, of course, the within manufacturing sector changes could be due to shifts within subsectors in manufacturing, which is another type of structural change that is growing the high value sectors perhaps uh, at the expense of the low value sectors. And we can actually do this similar decomposition within the manufacturing 30 subsectors and within 40, uh, 30 manufacturing sectors and 45 service sectors. And what we find is that um, of this 8.2% increase in the college share of employment in, in services, all of it is due to the within sector increase in the employment of skilled workers. The change in the structure is actually slightly negative, which means that it's not true that the high skill sectors are growing faster over this period at all. There's no structural change that's driving greater demand for high school workers. And if you look closely at the data, it's mainly driven by the fact that some public sectors like that are service sectors like education sector, teachers in China, which are huge sectors, or government sectors are declining slightly. And they're, these actually tend to be highly skilled sectors. Right? If you just restrict attention to what we call profit-oriented sectors, not these public sectors, then actually structural change does contribute about 1.48% to increased skill demand of college workers again, compared to 5.23% for the within sector change. So we do see kind of structural change towards more skill intensive sectors among the profit oriented sector, but it's being offset by the contraction in some of the high skilled public oriented sectors. And even if that's true, the still being dominated by the within sector increases in demand for skill, right? And if it's, if it's happening within all these sectors and many of these sectors, then it's probably not structural change. It should be more related to technology or systematic types of uh, choices that are being made given factor prices across the economy. Okay, so then what we can do, we don't have the education data after 2008. It just doesn't exist in China, the education structure within, within sectors. Um, but we do know the changes in employment. So we can still calculate how much, based on the 2008 skill, we can still see if the high skill sectors are growing faster than the low skill sectors, the structural change based on the 2008 base year Shares, of shares. And we, when we do that, we again don't find evi any evidence of a contribution of structural change to rising skill demand. For the main four sectors, it's a minus 0.25% because it turns out during this period the share of the construction sector grew because of the housing market in China. And within 14 service sectors, we can't do all 45 because we don't have data on that. But again, we find uh, a negative uh, contribution very small and negative over this uh, five-year period and it's mainly due to the shrinking public sector again over this period. So structural change is actually not associated at all with increased um, empl employment of skilled workers in China. So it's kind of a very surprising result to me and uh, in many other countries that are going through rapid change, structural change there is this increase in certain sectors, especially some of the high skill business service, financial sectors, et cetera, and we're not seeing that really in China thus far. Okay, and finally, I'm probably way over time. What am I doing? Oh, I actually have a little time. Okay, so finally, I want to talk about, back to the theory of job tasks, um, this idea that uh, um, Workers have skills which affect their productivity in different tasks. So there is this strong, so the tasks that I'm going to focus on here are going to be um, abstract, routine, and manual tasks. And this is uh, being measured based on a survey method and formula in terms of sets of questions to measure these skills developed by David Otor and uh, colleagues at MIT. And we uh, use those same uh, questions in our firm worker survey. Um, and uh, 
there's there's kind of an incom imperfect mapping between you know this your your skill level and the kind of work you do because obviously an employer can tell an educated person a, a, a very well educated person to go do something very manual if he wants right and you know everyone has an ability to do everything to some extent to some greater or a lower ability and and what kind of workers you use to do what kind of tasks will depend on the relative supply of those different workers and their price and as well as the types of technolo technological options uh, that you have. And so you could think that in China people are getting more educated but the skill, con the task, the kind of abstract content of the work is not increasing so it means that more educated people are being asked to do more manual stuff, right? That's one kind of solution to some of those inconsistencies, right? Yeah, Sujana. Do you have any kind of measure for TFP in services or manufacturing? Or manufacturing, we can construct something, but not services. It's very, very hard. Yeah. Uh, simple ones, maybe like uh, per worker output or something, you might. Labor product human resources. But not, not a true TFP in services. We tried, actually, and for some other work we're trying to do, but the data is really terrible. Uh, and incomplete in service sector. Okay, so we thought it's going to be interest of interest to understand how firms and occupation demand reward tasks and skills differently, um, and in particular how different firm characteristics demand different types of skills. Uh, and we, in particular, were interested in whether some of these uh, variables, like being an FDI firm or being an export-oriented firm or part of a glow or a processing trade firm, whether that's going to increase the likelihood you're going to be more specialized in routine tasks, which kind of fits in with this bigger story that globalization is leading to kind of insourcing of these routine jobs uh, in China. Outsourcing from the develop, more developed countries and insourcing into China. Okay, so uh, we uh, analyze these determinants of the task demand, looking especially at the firm characteristics, but also worker characteristics. And so these are the characteristics. We're gonna focus really on these here uh, uh, today. Um, the measurements, I'm not going to um, describe in any depth. You can check it out later. So it's just a set of questions with four to six response categories, and then you aggregate them up to conduct an index of how much this job really involves abstract work versus routine work versus manual work. Okay. Um, so what other predictions? So for foreign firms, we have this idea um, that foreign firms are more likely to offshore production via FDI. So if they're investing in China, then they're probably investing in uh, more routine, task-intensive types of uh, processes. Um, and one reason that's the case, and it's been developed theoretically in the economics literature, um, is that it's much easier to train and supervise and monitor production from a distance if the tasks are very routine, right? So if it's a very kind of complex task that require abstract work, you might not want to do FDI and do it in a foreign country because you really, it's going to be hard for you to convey that type of knowledge quickly to local managers and, um, and to monitor things as they're going on. But if everything's routine, it's more codifiable. You can write the manuals and then you can, they can just follow it, et cetera, right? Um, and the other thing, as I mentioned before, is that in an FDI or a global value chain setup, you can keep the more abstract tasks like strategy design and marketing in the home country. Um, also, if you're targeting consumers, you might actually want to offshore, um, and this actually works against this other prediction. So there's another paper that suggests that uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to tailor my goods to the local market, then I actually need to have salesmen and other people in the local market. Um, and that means that if my FDI is domestic market oriented, that it may be that tho those uh, firms may want to have actually more abstract tasks because they're going to need more salesmen and people to interact with uh, local consumers or firms, right? Um, so that would predict the opposite for, F, for the FDI variable. And then for exports, um, one thing is that export-oriented firms don't have to really work on domestic marketing as much. So they have fewer face-to-face -face interactions. And so that's less abstract and more routine. And as I said before, they're more likely to be part of these global value chains, which allows them to specialize in production um, with the other functions than elsewhere. However, there's this other uh, set of uh, papers that suggest that exporting firms tend to be more productive and produce higher quality products. 
And so that would suggest that actually they might require more abstract and less routine tasks, more management, et cetera. Um, however, in China, there's been some work on the export processing firms which show that they're actually lower productivity than domestic firms, although the domestic exporters are, tend to be more productive. Okay. And then finally, capital may also matter. Uh, capital can be complementary to abstract or routine jobs, depending on the type of capital. So for example, so for example computers could substitute for the routine and complement the abstract tasks. But other types of production machines could certainly just replace the manual work. So it depends on the types of machines. And then the size and the productivity of firms is probably going to be associated with more abstract tasks because um, there tend to be more levels of management, more, more complex kind of production processes, et cetera. Okay. So here's the main results on the task demand. We just put in the firm characteristics and see how it affects the demand for abstract, routine, and manual workers. And you can see that there's this significant negative effect on abstract tasks and a positive effect on routine tasks um, and manual tasks. Uh, for exporting, we also see a marginally negative effect on the abstract tasks. Again, positive coefficient on routine, kind of close to zero and insignificant on the manual. And then for the, la the capital, actually looks like it's complementary to, to abstract and substituting for the routine. And then the number of employees is also complementary to abstract. Uh, the larger firms have more abstract tasks. Uh, so that, a lot of that is consistent with those uh, predictions and the idea that globalization in China is actually contributing to more routine or middle skill tasks. Okay? That fits maybe into a possible explanation for those, some other motivating, motivating stylized facts. Okay. Um, and then we can also see the worker variables. Uh, no matter what you control for, you, there's this very strong specialization of college graduates in the abstract tasks and not in the routine or manual tasks, whereas the less educated workers are not doing any abstract work and are specializing in the routine. So these are quite, uh, quite strong. So the task demand is a window into the skill demand kind of patterns, but not a perfect mapping, right? Okay, so in this part, a few conclusions. The demand for abstract tasks is lower for firms with FDI, non-SOEs, firms that export, which are smaller or less capital intensive and less productive, and the opposite for the routine and manual tasks. So this suggests that the rising importance of globalization, the growth in FDI, trade liberalization under WTO, the growth of the global value chains is contributing to the increased demand for middle school jobs in China during the 2000s. If China's manufacturing in the future becomes more capital intensive, more productive, more dominated by domestic private firms, and less export oriented, all of, all, I think and all of these things are kind of things what, which we would maybe expect, then the demand for abstract and uh, will should increase and the demand for routine and manual tasks should decrease. Um, in the future. So that kind of feeds into this final slide and final thoughts on the future of jobs in China. Um, and that is that globalization and the lack of structural change in China has kind of limited the increased demand for these high skilled tasks and jobs. Um, and there should be some oppor opportunities to facilitate a more responsive structural change to, uh, to demand work and employ work of high skill workers, especially in the service sectors where we know that uh, they're still kind of not very open to competition as many, uh, at least not as open as many would like. And some of these sectors aren't growing uh, as fast as I think the Chinese government or, or uh, workers would like. Um, and so, I think that has some implications for uh, areas of the economy which seem a bit stuck in terms of pushing forward with uh, more adaptive structural change. Um, but the second part is this, uh, of, I think, of, of my thinking about this issue uh, looking forward is that even though we see this unusual pattern of China as an outlier of growing the middle skill jobs, maybe for reasons that we're you know, trying to explain, 
in the end of the day, these global processes are probably going to be inevitable for China as well. Um, and those processes, uh, we're, we're seeing it uh, to some extent. Actually, is there a slide here? Um, we're seeing the increasing substitution of routine tasks with computers and robots, even in the Pearl River Delta. Um, and um, we are seeing firms now start to outsource routine tasks to other places, or many Chinese firms are now investing in, uh, in other countries. FDI, outward FDI is growing extremely fast now in China. Um, and the rising uh, wages and the rising costs of labor are really going to eventually make it not so profitable for firms, uh, for other countries to outsource to China as opposed to other, other developing countries. Um, so that is going to suggest that in the future, and we kind of um, uh, saw some hints of that even within manufacturing in terms of the trends in the characteristics of manufacturing firms, right? that they should point to more demand for skill, intensive work, and tasks, abstract tasks in the future. Um, and that's going to reward skill more and increase inequality. So the kind of um, depressing thing about inequality for China is that um, China has reached a very high level of inequality in terms of the Gini coefficient if you compare it to other countries in the world. And that's despite the fact that it saw this increase in employment in middle skill jobs, right? Um, and we're still trying to kind of understand better how you can even reconcile those two facts, right? And if it's the case where these global processes of polarization start to hit China in the future, then that's just going to put more pressure on even higher uh, rates of uh, inequality. So let me stop there and open the floor for questions. Yes. Uh, but why is the lack of structural change? Um, I think part of it in the in the 2000s, it's not really structural change. I, I, I should be careful, right? Um, there is a lack of structural change in which higher skill intensive sectors are growing faster than low skill intensive sectors in that sense, right? Of course, there's always structural change. There's always changes occurring in the structure of the economy. But it's not, it's not moving towards a more skill intensive structure. And that could, because, could be because China, in a global context, still, compared to many other countries, has comparative advantage in the less skill intensive sectors, right? Which is what we're seeing, right? Uh, in the processing trade in China, that grew a lot after WTO, right? Um, so that's, even though the supply of workers in China overall is increasing in their skill level, you know, and this is kind of the difficulty, right? In terms of uh, what jobs are there and the demand and the specialization relative to other countries, the tasks in the economy or this, uh, uh, there's, still, there's still plenty of opportunity for China to uh, produce or even expand in these uh, low skill intensive manufacturing sectors, right? Uh, I think if wages keep going up, that can't continue forever, right? It's my own view. But um, with uh, global production chains and um, and other maybe advantages of, of, of producing in China uh, connected to it, it seems to be sus to have sustained pretty far, actually. You know, well beyond the 90s, certainly, and into the 2000s. But I mean, in China, I think the 2000s really is the decade of globalization in China more so than even than the 1990s, right, in terms of when China really, really peaked, right? So that would be my answer. I don't know if it makes sense. Government policy has nothing to do with it? No, I think government, I, I try to suggest that, especially in services where the public sector itself, you know, is a big employer of high-skilled workers, right? I just didn't realize, appreciate it earlier before getting into this kind of, this research, how big the skill differences are in the, in services versus manufacturing, and then in some of the in some of the um, specific service sectors, especially the uh, teachers and you know lots of teachers are college educated, right? And even now in primary schools, you know, most teachers so that's a huge number of people in the labor force, and in government offices too, they've skilled up quite a lot. Um, but then in late, lately they've been declining a bit, you know, the, the, as a share of the, which is probably a good thing, but it leads to these results that as as a whole, you don't see um, 
you don't see the movement into the high school sectors. But I think there are barriers to entry in uh, high school service sectors as well. You know, telecom, finance, uh, business services hopefully less so, but I, I don't really know how those markets work very well. Maybe other people know better. So John. I have a few questions. Did you yeah. find skill mismatch that college educated workers are being matched with jobs that are not that don't match their skills? Or did you or did you not actually test for that? I'm not clear. Um we didn't test for it directly. There's a very strong association between your education and doing abstract jobs and not manual. But you know, if we looked at what every college worker is doing. I'm sure we could find a bunch who are not, who are in occupations which you would consider on the low end of the kind of abstract. We haven't done that type of categorization work. I'm not sure what the norms are for that kind of thing either. What's high, what's low relative to other places? Because people do lots of things for different reasons, right? Because on the one hand, you're finding that it's middle skill jobs where the growth is. On the other hand, you're finding college, I mean, it is true that there are more and more college educated people. So that all, that's why I guess. And that's right. And you also see that the increase in skilling is happening within sectors, not, and it's not that the high skill sectors are growing more than the low skill sectors. It's that all of the sectors are skilling up, which means that all the sectors are hiring more college graduates, even the ones that initially were low skill sectors, right? And you don't have wage data. So yeah. But you don't. But but yeah. So you don't know if that's. It could be that. I'm in a low skill sector, and the sector as a whole is just upgrading and changing the technology and using college. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're asking the college graduate to sweep the floors necessarily, right? So, is there so evidence of that? That they're scaling <laughs> up their technologies? Um, I don't think we have direct evidence of that. I think if we had wages, we could do a little bit better job of that, right? Um, and so I think uh, now that we've kind of figured out, so there's a couple of pieces to this work, I think. Um, with the survey data for manufacturing, and then I'm, we're invo I'm involved in another project doing a lot of task measurement for a general urban labor survey where we get the similar data on, uh, on uh, service sector and other sectors, right? And then we'll have wages and these tasks. Uh, then. Then we can, the, then we can do something a bit, uh, and it, even if we don't have the task measures, if we have the occupation uh, wage data, if we have individual wage data and occupation data and education data going way back, you know, we can certainly do something. Although the uh, in the urban household survey data, for instance, in China, the occupation categories are somewhat limited. They're not as rich as the census. For the census data, you have like three-digit occupations. You know, have hundreds of occupations, so you can really get at it a little bit better. In the in the urban surveys, there's only you know 15 occupations and a similar number of sectors. But I think that's kind of where we're headed to try to use the different data sources to try to get cut at this problem in different ways and try to understand. Uh, if we believe in the local labor market story, we can also look at regional variation and see whether, is it true that cities or provinces that have high FDI penetration or high export orientation or increases in those types of traits, we see differences in the, in, in the types of uh, occupation structure that are consistent with, uh, with this theory of hollowing out, of, of the globalization contributing to the kind of uh, specialization in middle skill jobs. Any other questions? Okay, then thank you very much for coming today.